John didn't like anybody that played a whole lot of notes, so I was perfect, you know. Call for us uh, your fateful meeting with John Lennon. How did he first get? A, uh, he first heard a tape of you guys. Real quick, we did a, a live radio uh, broadcast out on Long Island at WLIR, right. and uh, Billy Joel was uh, the opening act for us. And uh, we didn't even know who he was. I, I remember treating him like shit because we just didn't know, you know, <laughs> in that days, you know, like who in the hell is this guy? So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, they made a little tape in those days on the radio broadcast. They made like a seven and a half copy that was always running, you know, in case they captured something really cool. So then we did a really hot set. And then, and then you get a cassette at the end, the old deal. And so little did we know, Jerry Rubin, the activist, the political activist, slipped that tape to John and Yoko. They had made friends a little bit uh, before that. And uh, John loved it. You know, he heard uh, everything he needed, all the ingredients, because he'd been scouring New York and, the, and America uh, pretty good for players. He was sick of that Clapton uh, thing, you know. The high, well, the clouds warm in the whole Yeah, the high-flying crowd, as we yeah. could put it. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he loved Stan Bronstein, the saxophone. Right. He, so, because you know, I guess it had been Bobby Keys up till that point, right? right? right, right. So not, nothing wrong with no, Bobby no, Keith, no, no, no. but Stan was special, you know, and he recognized that right off the bat. But even more so, uh, Wayne Tex Gabriel, yeah, right. who had just yeah, came right. out of uh, Mitch Ratter and the Detroit Wheels, he was just unbelievable guitar player. And John loved him, and they had a lot in common. Both of their mothers had died, and, okay. you know, they, they used to sit on the floor cross-legged at the record plant and just talk for hours, and we'd just have to order food. I mean, it was just, <laughs> they had this special thing going on, you know. Uh, so, and, uh, and, of course, I guess we'll get down to me. Uh, <laughs> he kind of heard Klaus in me, which is true. You know, we both have an R&B basic style going on, simple and uh, John didn't like anybody that played a whole lot of notes, so I was perfect, you know. Well, that's what Tony uh, Levin said, and yeah, you and yeah. Klaus are the consummate pocket players. Yeah, and Tony and I talked about that on the way out of the L uh, Lennon NYC movie, you know. Mm -hmm. And he looked, I said, I really respect your playing, and he says, Mr. Pocket. <laughs> <laughs> right, wow. <laughs> nice compliment. Wow. After the, they received the tape and right. uh, became interested, we kind of didn't, we kind of heard the rumor, but we didn't really believe it, so... We got word that they'd like to stop by Magna Graphics Studio, which is on Bank Street, and they just lived like eight doors down at that time, and uh, Bob Pruitt, and uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so one night they just came in, you know, and uh, we didn't believe it. We were like in the middle of working on a new original song or something, and we kept them waiting and out in the vestibule for like an hour or so, you know, not knowing. <laughs> So finally, the, our roadie walks in and like panicked look on his face and said, they're waiting outside. I says, okay, let's go. And they came in and John had that white suit on from Abbey Road. Oh. And my jaw just went, <laughs> you know, it was like, wow. And it was the beginning of a great friendship. What was the dynamic with John Lennon in the band? Because obviously when anybody joins a band, it changes the dynamic a little bit. But you've got someone who's not your average band member. Yeah. Well, we had to bring John up to speed a little bit. Really? Yeah, I mean, we, we weren't, uh, we were way f further along musically as players than John was, you know. Um, if I don't say so, I mean, I mean, we were killing it every day, you know, and John hadn't played guitar in six years, something like that. Seriously, in a while. So, and he knew it. He mm -hmm. was, that's why he loved us, because we were very accepting. And John, he, oh, that's a minor chord there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was, uh, but he was great. He, he just, his chops came back very, very quickly. And as soon as we got into a regular rehearsal schedule, uh, I mean like a couple of times a week. Mm -hmm. This is before we started working for the garden, which was, right. we rented the uh, East uh, 
uh, the, the theater down on the east side and rehearsed uh, for two weeks every day, two sessions. Wow. So John was a slave driver and that, you know, he didn't uh, want to have anything to do with uh, not knowing the arrangements or this or that. So, of course, when the garden came, he was the one that screwed up all the arrangements and, and had a cold, you know, he right. wasn't a little sniffly. The day. You'd never know it seeing those, yeah. uh, the two shows. It's a lot to do, two shows with your reputation on the line in yeah. one day when you have a cold. You know, now, so. now talk about you as a bass player and your and your your band members. You're playing the clubs of New York, and now you're with John Lennon. You you're thrust onto the world stage. How does how did you deal with that? Well, some people were accepting, and some weren't. I mean, I guess that's always the case, right? And on the newspaper, or, uh, what where you were reading, you know, most people were pretty acceptable. You know, the the new were the new hot shit. <laughs> but uh, I, there were some bad reviews in there. You know, people that just weren't accepting of anyone. Okay. Oh, touching one of the Beatles? You're <laughs> working with one of them? How could we let that happen? Yeah, now you, uh, you recorded one of the most controversial Beatles, solo Beatle records sometime in New York City. Um, did you, re at the time, did you, when you were waxing that record, did you realize the type of impact it was going to have. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was going to bomb, I mean, just from the lyrics alone. I mean, but you know, you go through the motions, you're a pro, you know. We're used to doing sessions every day, that's what we did. All of us were right. studio players, doing jingles, Tijuana Smalls, Uncle Ben's <laughs> Rice, whatever. You know, it paid the bills, so by the time we got to the studio, we just kept with our, our professionalism and, uh, you know, they bring in a song a night. Mm -hmm. At the record plant, you started at seven o'clock, and you finished at seven in the morning. John was looking at it like it was a newspaper story. Mm -hmm. The topic of the day, you came in, you learned your parts right on the spot. Never heard the song before, as all studio players do. <laughs> it was nothing new to us, but uh, and he was very accepting. That never rammed any parts down anyone's throats or anything like that. We were all free to come up with our own stuff. And uh, in that regard, it was, it was great because uh, what more can you ask for as a studio player, not having a producer shoving stuff down your throat, you know? No. Elephant's memory was portrayed as a scruffy band, like these street musicians. But now I listen to this record. This is one hell of a tight record. I mean, you guys were right on the dime. This was not a sloppy Neil Young Crazy Horse record. I think the, where that got started was mm. because John did that David Peel record before right, us. Okay. <laughs> so I think everybody thought, well, and some of the bad reviews were, yeah. you know, these guys are just people off the street that are just going to take, uh, take on John and uh, do the best they can. But uh, you're right. Thank you for that yeah. compliment. Uh, so no one realized at the time, I think, that, that the Elephants had been together since 1965, had done, you know, eight albums before that and had hit two or three hit singles. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them a top 40 in Mongoose, so. And all accomplished um, musicians. In, in exactly. Mongoose. Schooled, too. You know, I mean, Adam Ippolito, the keyboard player, went to Ithaca College, music, and uh, I graduated from the City University in New York in music, and Stan was in the, the I think he was in the Army Band or something. Okay. Or Navy, one of the two. Sorry, it's been too many years. <laughs> but st everyone except the drummer, uh, Rick Frank was schooled. Okay, and then John band. used Jim Keltner for on that record. Yeah, I think that's the reason because okay. it's not that he didn't have faith in Rick. Rick was really an excellent percussionist. Okay. You know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. a difference right. of, of a trap player and a, and a percussionist. So John got the bright idea since I've been working with Jim, uh, I'll just bring him in and to do the basic, you know foot, snare, mm -hmm. the basic feel, right. and then we'll use Rick to lighten up to his load to do all the sweetening with all the percussion and all that stuff, kungas and cowbell and all that stuff. And even at that rate, we ended up bringing in Harry Balafani's uh, kunga player, Ooh. Angel Allende, who's one of the most renowned of all times, uh, to do a lot of this stuff as well, and brought in uh, other horn players. and. I actually got a chance to play trumpet, which is my first oh, instrument, okay. right. and, uh, did, and on Yoko's albums as well, I did a little trumpet in there, and that was actually the last time I ever played trumpet. <laughs> We will hear more from Gary in the coming weeks. 
And on the next Know Your Bass Player, Tom talks Bob Dylan and Rolling Thunder with Rob Stoner. See you then. I had a gig working with John Harold okay. as his bass player. And Bob came to see us numerous times. Mm -hmm. One time that he came to see us after the show, he really got next to me and said, hey man, you know, let's do something someday. And we hung out and jammed all night in Chris Christopherson's room, by the way, oh. at the uh, Chateau Marmont, I think it was, and uh, in LA. Okay. So uh, I said, okay, great. But you know how many people say, oh, let's do something sometime. Yeah, oh, yeah. And all, it's, you hear that all, all the fucking okay. time, right? But Bob meant it. All right. And eventually he called me.